Okay, I'm gonna begin. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. So first, a few things about me, if you don't know me. Uh, my name is Vittorio Romeo. I'm a software engineer at Bloomberg LP in the London office. I do some courses on C++, and I also have a bunch of YouTube videos, mostly from my old days when I was doing hobbying, hobbyist game development. I also have a web page where I like to write articles about weird things we can do at compile time with lambdas and metaprogramming, and I also try to participate in standardization. I have a few papers, including the one we're going to talk about today. Uh, finally, I also have a bunch of open source projects. I like giving talks and presentations and answering your questions on Stack Overflow or downvoting them. So, this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about high order functions, what they are how we can use them to improve our code, and how we can implement them. And then the second half of the talk will be about this abstraction function ref, which I propose for the standard, and we're gonna see how it interacts with higher order functions, and how it's different from other things like a CD function. Uh, as a disclaimer, I'm not gonna be here to evangelize you about functional programming. I want to give you, I, I like functional programming, I think it's a good paradigm, but I want to give you um, an idea of how you can use uh, high order functions in, a pr in practical everyday case uses in your source code without having to convert your entire code base to follow the functional paradigm. We're also gonna take a look at existing functional facilities in the, in the language that you can use to implement high order functions and also in general, if you're interested, what goes into a C++ 20 proposal, or rather I should say 23 now. Uh, my assumptions are that you are somewhat familiar with Lambda expressions, templates, and more C++ features, but please do not hesitate to ask questions. I'm happy to help you understand if something is missing. Okay, let's begin with the idea of high order functions. So how many of you know what a high order function is? Okay, it's pretty good, you can go. So Wikipedia has a decent definition, I think, and it says that in mathematics and computer science, a higher order function is a function that does at least one of the following. So it either takes one or more functions as arguments or it returns a function as its result. A very simple example is this function here called call twice. What we do is simply accept some callable object f and then we invoke it twice in the body. And as an example, we can invoke call twice passing a closure generated by a lambda expression over here that prints out hello. And the result of this code would be printing out hello, hello. Uh, as you can see here, we decide to take this function object as a template parameter, but we also have other ways to implement high order functions in C++. Another example is this one, is a little bit more uh, involved and is of the second case. So this is, this is a function called greater than, as you can see returns auto because we're gonna return another fun function from this one. It takes a threshold, which is basically uh, the value that our desired element has to be greater than. Then we return a lambda that caps captures the threshold by value. This lambda itself will take another argument and it will return whether the, the argument is greater than the threshold. So once we have this, we can now use it inside an algorithm like uh, as an example of cdcountif with some values and we can generate our predicate on the spot by saying greater than five, and that function call will generate the predicate, and we can use this to basically uh, verify and assert that there are two elements greater than five inside the vector. So as you can see, instead of putting the lambda there, we can have this kind of abstraction that allows us to generate it quite nicely, and this kind of uh, model also lends itself pretty well to composition. Uh, here, again, we use a different implementation technique. We take an int in and then we return a closure using an auto return type. We could have returned a CD function, but then there are, there are pros and cons uh, depending on what we decide to do. So again, it's very flexible. Uh, C++ is very flexible in the way it lets you decide how to implement high order functions. So, do you think we have any other high order function in C++ standard? Can you name a few maybe? Shout. Find if, yeah, okay, that's too easy. What about the C standard? Do we have any higher order function in the C standard? Q yes? Sort, Q sort, uh, sort Q -sort, right? Q sort. Q -sort huh? Anything weirder? Nobody? Okay, we don't like C, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so there's actually a few in the C standard. There's Q sort, as you mentioned. There's also B search, so these are like two algorithms. Um, but then even things like add exit, add quick exit, and signal, they kind of fit the definition of high order function. So if you, if you think about it, it doesn't always have to be an algorithm or something mathematical. Anything that accepts another function is part of the definition. So I wanna take signal as an example because it's weird and nobody does it. 
But in general, uh, signal is basically a function that allows you to attach a handler to a particular signal when it's uh, raised in your application. The signature is quite weird because it's all implementation defined, but you can see here we take a signal and then some sort of handler. And if we look down, it says that the handler has to be uh, either some weird macros or a pointer to a function, and the signature of this function must be equivalent to basically a C function that takes an int and returns void. So this fits the bill for a higher order function, and as an example, we could use it with a lambda over here. We call a city signal. We say that when we get a sig int, we want to uh, invoke this handler. And since this is a stateless closure, it can be convertible, if it can be converted implicitly to a function pointer, so it's fine. And this also proves that lambda expressions and higher order functions kind of work really well together. Uh, I think this is technically undefined behavior because if you look at the documentation of signal, you are allowed to do only a few things inside uh, the handler you provide and printing is not one of them, but I don't care. It shows uh, a different interpretation of higher order functions. In C++, we have a lot of them. We have stuff like set terminate, which kind of is similar to signal, but then also stuff like visit, apply, and invoke. These are all high order functions. We have bind, which is terrible and should be replaced by lambdas. But now in 20, we have bind front, which fixes the issues with bind and is now not a recommended way of binding arguments. And pretty much everything inside numeric and algorithm is an high order function. So anything, someone mentioned find if, but stuff like accumulate, count if, they're all high order functions. And there's a ton more. So the C++ standard is full of them. This is one of the idioms that is uh, taught uh, like to beginners, especially if they're trying to make a game or something that requires entity management. It's called the erase remove idiom. And basically what happens here is that if you have a vector of entities, you can imagine these are either game entities or particles, whatever, and you want to get rid in an efficient way of all the entities that are now dead or you don't need them anymore, then instead of going through the vector one by one and shifting everything, if you combine the remove if algorithm, which basically moves all the elements to keep towards the beginning of the range, and then the dot erase member function of the vector, you can actually do it very efficiently. You do just a few swaps, reorder elements, and then delete everything from the iterator return by remove if to the end, and, it, and, it, and you, it, it gives you the vector with only the alive entities. So this is a nice uh, example of how you can compose high order functions to get a useful result. This is something a little bit more interesting, I think. Um, we don't have pattern matching in C++ yet. There's people working on that, like David Sankel and Michael Park. There's a few proposals flying around. Um, but you can create your own poor man's version of pattern matching by basically combining this visit, which is provided by the standard library, and this overload. So if you've never seen this before, it's quite interesting. Uh, I think Bjarne had an example of this in the keynote. Basically, overload takes a bunch of lambdas or functions and returns an overload of them. So in this case, I'm overloading on a lambda takes connect, disconnect, and heartbeat. And then visit takes a visitor and a variant, and it dispatches the Var the, the variant element to the correct part of the visitor. So in this case, my variant is just either a connect, disconnect, or artbeat. I have a bunch of things that I want to do with them. And then if I process an event with connect, it's going to actually go and hit this connect branch and so on. So this is like, if you squint, it's kind of like pattern matching. It's not as elegant and not as powerful, but it does the job in most of the cases. So if you're interested in this and how to implement it even for recursive lambdas, recursive variants and more um, tricky use cases. I have a few, uh, I gave this talk before. So what are the main use cases of higher order functions? I think that in general, avoiding repetition is one of them. They help avoiding, you know, copy pasting. Inversion of control flow is probably the most important one. We're going to spend a little bit of time on that. Uh, asynchronicity as well, like if you think about future and stuff like that, all of it is based on higher order functions. And also they lend themselves really well to compile time metaprogramming. I'm gonna show you an example later. So about avoid repetition, um, there's you know many schools of thought about this. I like to avoid repetition as soon as possible, but some people like say, uh, okay, you can copy paste it a few times and then after you can reduce repetition. But in general, C++ gives us the tools to, do, to avoid repetition quite easily from the beginning. And I, I think that avoiding that leads to less bugs and less maintenance overhead. Sometimes it's really easy, like you don't, need, you don't even need uh, higher order functions, higher order function. In this example, uh, we had some sort of integration test and we wanted to spawn a bunch of stuff on machines. 
uh, to simulate multiple machines, and we needed uh, unique ports for all the machines. So as you can see here, we just copy pasted this reserve port with localhost over and over again. However, it's really easy in C++11 to just introduce a small local function inside the body of the test. You give it a nice name, like get port or get unique port, and then you don't have to repeat the same address over and over. And you can just use the functions we can see here. It's not a huge win, it doesn't have that big of an impact, but if you find yourself you know, changing the way you reserve a port, or if you want to log every time you acquire a new port, instead of doing it every single time, you now have a nice place where you can do that without having to change the rest of your code. However, some other cases uh, are more complicated. As an example here, um, this is, I was working on a UI system when I was younger. It wasn't the best design, so I had to basically um, loop through the widgets multiple times. First, I need to loop at all, all the visible widgets and recalculate the focus. After that, I needed to loop and recalculate the boundaries of the widgets, and then I could finally update them, and the order was important. And I ended up with something like this. Uh, now, this is not terrible, but again, if you are doing more operations or if you want to add a new one or remove one, there is a lot of repetition in the loop structure and the predicate. So one thing you could do is you create a higher order function, you might call it with a decent name like for visible children, which explains what the loop is actually doing. Then you accept any callable f as your argument. You uh, provide the loop as part of your higher order function and then you use something like std invoke or just a function call to make this work. And then the actual business logic of update becomes really easy to read. It's just for the visible children, recalculate the focus, then the bounce and the update. Uh, the good thing about this is not just that you avoid repetition, but if you change the way you store the widgets, maybe you start using a map or something that's not a vector, then you, know, you only have to change the logic of the iteration inside your for visible children, not everywhere you had the, the business logic. So it creates this kind of nice separation between uh, what is happening and how it's happening. And this brings me to the next point, which is the other use case for higher order functions that I think is the most important one, which is inversion of control flow. As you can see um, in the example before, sometimes these use cases overlap. Sometimes inverted control flow is a way to reduce repetition. And in general, if you've never heard this term before, it's about uh, separating what happens from how it happens. And rather than having the control flow explicit in your business logic, you invoke a function that provides the control flow with you, for you with the action that you want to be executed. Uh, the main example of this, in my opinion, is C++17 parallel algorithms. As, um, as you might be aware, they take some sort of action or predicate and then under the hood, they can do uh, dispatching or scheduling in uh, the most complicated way possible to get all the performance out of it. So as an example here, we have this physics components struct, which has a position, velocity, and acceleration, a bunch of them in a vector. And now if, you, if there are going to be thousands or hundreds of thousands, we want to parallelize this for each. So in CSPAS 17, we can simply specify this execution policy. Par and seek, I think, is the most lenient one. It allows it to run, uh, to be vectorized and run in any order. Uh, then we specify the range, and then we provide a callable or a lambda to decide what to do. And in this case, I just want to increment the velocity by the acceleration and the position by the velocity. So why is this nice? It's because we don't have to care about all the details uh, regarding the scheduling or how the threads are managed or how this thing is parallelized. We leave the, uh, the, all the responsibility to deal with the control flow to the algorithm itself, and what we do is simply provide the action, so what we care about. Um, so decoupling the control flow of reaction is not just good for performance and readability, but it also allows you to easily test what you're doing. Um, it might be harder to test both the control flow and a complicated action at the same time, but if you separate the control flow from the action, then you can provide some sort of dummy or stub that makes it easier to test the control flow in isolation and the action in isolation. And then once you combine the two pieces, it's easier to see, uh, to have more confidence in the correctness of your code. Another example of this is printing a common separated list of elements. This is a quite um, normal thing to do if you want some pretty logging for your containers. The initial version might look something like this. You might be hard coding it on a vector, so not any range. Then you check if the vector is empty, and if it is, you do nothing. Otherwise, you just print out the first element. And then from the second element onwards, you print out some separator and some iterator. 
So I like this version because it doesn't require a predicate check on each iteration. It just does one in the beginning to check if the vector is empty, and then it just prints out the stuff. Um, the point of this example is when I see these kind of functions, I, I immediately see it's a hard coded on vector, it's hard coded on a specific separator, it's hard coded on the idea of printing. So if I wanted to test this, I would have to care about all these details. What you can do instead is you can ident identify the structure of this abstraction or algorithm. So as you can see here, what really matters is that we check for emptiness, then we do some action, then we iterate, we do some separation, and then some action. So now that you identify what could be customized, what could be extracted, you can just create an abstraction that does that for you. And now this is the next step. It's a little bit more complicated, more, gener more generic, more general. I Call this force separated is not the best name, I agree with that, but it takes a range, an action to execute when printing and an action to execute when separating. And now that you completely uh, generalize these steps, it might be easier to test this algorithm with some easier actions to verify and also it's more flexible. You can use it in different ways with different kind of ranges and with different kind of functions. And now all, all we do is basically just call the action in the beginning, the separation, and the, the action again. It's the same algorithm, it's just more general. And this is possible because f and fsep are going to be uh, closure types or function objects, so we achieve this thanks to higher order functions. Then we can simply redefine print in terms of force separated, so we don't have to change the existing public API. Uh, we simply invoke force separated with our vector. Our action will be simply printing out to a CDC out and our separation will be printing out a comma and a space. So now we can also maybe parameterize this with different separators, or if you don't want to use out, you can use something else. In general, the idea is that for separated is reusable, provides the control flow, and the user provides the actions, and also it aids with testing. Another example how you could use this to have a different effect. Uh, if you're running some sort of combine, command line application and you want to uh, make some of the text more, give more emphasis to some of the text, Maybe you want to do some sort of wide printing, like this one over here, with a space between every character. Then you can reuse the same for separated, uh, just change the separator, and you get a brand new function almost for free. Make sense so far? This is another example, an actual uh, real one from production. So this was when I was working on a distributed trading system. And we had this particular design where we had an order set of things. Uh, we wanted to loop through the another set. And for each element in the set that matched a specific predicate, we wanted to do some action on it and then remove it from the set. I think we used this for uh, machine nodes. We were looking for all the machine nodes that were initialized. If we find an initialized one, we do some, some action there. And then we move it into the set of initialized ones. So it was like this kind of algorithm. And we had this multiple place in the code base, and it was quite easy to identify an abstraction. I called it consume if. And basically what we do, we take a range, a predicate, and a function. We go through the range with a normal iterator-based for loop. Then we check if the predicate is valid for the element. If it is, we execute our action on it, which might be you know initialize it or um, call some member function on it. And then we get rid of the element from this range with the intention to, of possibly putting it into another set for performance reasons. And since iterating on another set and removing stuff at the same time is annoying to copy paste because you need to take care of the iterator and it's also easy to forget to do that, just wrapping this into a consuming function makes the business code way leaner and easier to read and also it prevents mistakes with uh, you know, dealing with the iterator. So this was a huge win in terms of readability and safety for us. Uh, other use case I want to talk about is asynchronicity. Um, so currently, higher order functions, I think they are the easiest way of expressing asynchronous callbacks. If you think about future thread, the way you compose them is usually by composing lambdas. Uh, disclaimer is that now we have coroutines in 20, so many of these use cases you might see might be superseded by coroutines. This is an example from another one of my talks, uh, but in general, the same principle applies to boost future or future libraries. The idea is that you kind of build a graph of computations or actions at compile time or a runtime. You attach continuations with some dot then or dot when all. 
and then the runtime or the scheduler takes care of executing that asynch asynchronously for you. As an example, here I have an all node, and the all node takes an arbitrary number of computations. And in this case, I just want to do two HTTP, HTTP GET requests, which might be long, so I want them to be executed in parallel. And then after both of them have been executed in parallel, I can attach another continuation with dot then. This continuation will take a tuple of the two results. So in this case, it might be two data payloads from the, from the internet. And then after I got the results, I might want to apply some stitching on them and get some final result. So the idea here is that you are using these abstractions like all, dot then, dot when all, and so on to um, tell the compiler or the runtime how you want your computation to be shaped. And then you provide your actions with other functions. So this, again, fits the bill of high order functions. And if you're interested, again, I have a talk on this and how to implement this particular system. And then another more interesting use case is metaprogramming. In general, C++ doesn't really allow you to introduce new language constructs without either abusing macros or templates. However, uh, a combination of templates and lambda expressions can work quite well as the approximation of a language construct. As an example, something I needed in the past was enumerating over a list of compile time types. And what I wanted was some sort of iteration that gives me both the index of the type and also the type itself. I needed this for some gating development uh, entity component system where I was trying to create various buffers for different types of components. Uh, the way this works is that I have this function called enumerate types. It takes an arbitrary number of types as part of the template arguments, in this case, int, float, and char. And then what I provide is a C++ 20 lambda. Now in 20, you can use angle brackets as part of your lambda to have template arguments. And this lambda will take as the first template argument the type, and the second one, an index, which is a constant expression. And then in the body, I can do anything I want with T and I. So in this case, as an example, I simply print them out. And I get 0i, 1f, and 2c, as those are the indices and type ID names of the, of the actual things I pass to enumerate types. Now, this is not a language construct. I would like to see something like ex expansion statements, which unfortunately got uh, kicked out of 20. But it's good enough. Like, it, it expresses the idea of enumerating over a set of types. It kind of looks like a loop if you squint. And it's way better than using recursion or, you know, copy-pasting this thing over and over. OK. So another interesting thing I was um, researching when running this talk was that sometimes the same abstraction, or rather the same uh, goal, can be achieved with, the same, with different abstractions. As an example, sometimes you can use a high order function, but to achieve the same thing, maybe our RAI guard would work or an iterator would work. So I wanted to understand what are the pros and cons of these things. Uh, imagine this particular example. Imagine we have, we need thread safe access to an object. What people usually do is create a class that has the object and a mutex, and then they lock the mutex every single time. Uh, this works, but you can forget to lock the mutex, and if you want to expose it to the, to the client is art, what do you do? Do you expose the mutex, or do you re-implement the entire interface of the thing? So I really hate that pattern, and I see it a lot. Uh, easier way of achieving this is imagining that you have some sort of wrapper called synchronized. Synchronized takes any T, so in this case a foo or whatever you want, and then synchronized is supposed to give you some sort of way to access the contents that are wrapped in a thread-safe manner. Um, so just imagine which way would you use to uh, allow users to get into synchronized, use the entire interface of foo without having to manually lock and potentially forgetting to do so. Uh, you could use something like RAI guards or high order functions. So let's see how they differ. Uh, on the left, we have the example with RAI guards. You can imagine the synchronized foo provides a dot access method. And this dot access returns some sort of unspecified guard called uh, you know, synchronized guard or something like that. And in this case, from the guard itself, which is named f here, we can access all the methods of foo. So maybe we could overload the star operator or the arrow operator, and this will allow us to um, access the foo methods without having to implement the interface. And you can imagine on construction, the guard will uh, take the mutex, and on destruction, it will release it. So that's the nice thing about this pattern. Uh, on the other hand, you can implement the exact same thing using a high order function. So as an example, you could have a dot access function that takes some lambda, and the lambda itself will take the unwrapped type, in this case a foo, and then inside the body of the lambda, you can do whatever you want. 
So now, um, I would say that the one on the left is friendly to control flow, because if you use this inside of a loop, you can use break, continue, you can do an early return, while the one on the right uh, doesn't work like that, because you cannot put a return, a continue, or break inside of the body of the lambda. It will be part of the lambda itself, so it's another context. Also, the one on the left doesn't need any captures, while the one on the right might require captures, and you know it's unfriendly to control flow. So why would you ever go for the one on the right? Uh, there's a very important plus, which is it's a simpler to implement, and we're going to see this in a second. But if you need something easy and quick, the higher order function works quite well. So if you want to implement the one on the left, the one with the guard, what you have to do is basically um, write some sort of access guard uh, class. It will have to hold the mutex, provide your operator arrow, operator star, and maybe all the other stuff like constructors, maybe delete the copy constructor, and so on. So it's not hard, but there is a little bit of boilerplate involved, which can be annoying, especially if you want to do this just once. And then you simply return the guard uh, wrapping the, the thing that has the mutex and the object. However, for a high order function, it's literally two lines. So it's super easy. You just have this access function. It takes some callable f. You just log the mutex and invoke f with the object. So it's trivial to implement, it's trivial to review. It's not as nice to use, but I would agree that taking the time, I hope you would agree that taking the time to write these two lines of code is better than manually locking the thing over and over or re-implementing the interface of what you're trying to expose to the user. Another example that has the same exact conditions is benchmarking. You could have some sort of benchmark function that give another function benchmarks it, or you could achieve the same with a guard. So again, the pros and cons are um, the same, but the, the ideas still apply. Another interesting thing we can compare high order functions to are iterators. And if we get another use case, uh, like iterating over a range after filtering it with some predicate, then you can see again we have this dichotomy of um, iterators and high order functions. On the left hand side, you can see that we might do something like range based for loop over x. And then we loop over filtered of ints and even. And you can imagine this filtered function is some sort of um, function that returns a range, which wraps an existing range and filters while iterating. So something like every enablers work. Uh, and again, this is way friendly to control flow because you can break, you can continue, you can do an early return. It's also more composable with STD because it's, it's based on iterators and ranges. However, the implementation is complicated and it's way more complicated than what we've seen before. Uh, while on the other side, if we see a high order function version, you have to hard code what desired function is doing. So you can say for filtered, then you can provide your range, your predicate, and then an action. And then this will, will execute the action only on the elements that match the predicate. Again, the implementation is simpler, but you might require to capture stuff and is not friendly to control flow. So why would you ever do the one on the right? Well, if you want to implement something like a filter iterator, as you can see here from the synopsis taken from Boost Iterator, is definitely not trivial. And you know you might do this once for your team, for your code base, and have a lot of tests, a lot of um, you know checking that this thing is correct. However, it takes a long time to implement and ensure that it works correctly. Even more if you want a range-based version that cleanly integrates with the rest of STD. Uh, however, if you want to implement the higher order function, again, it's just two lines of code, super easy. You simply create this abstraction that takes a range, predicate, and an action. And you say, OK, I'm going to iterate over the range. If the predicate is true, I'm going to call the action. So as you can see, I feel like the model of high-order function leads, uh, lends itself better to quick and easy implementations, while the other models are more composable, more um, reusable, but they take more effort and time to implement. There's also another thing which is really interesting about uh, high order function iteration. It can sometimes be faster compared to ranges or iterators because of the way it is defined. So if you think about having two separate ranges, maybe uh, you're writing again a UI and you have a bunch of names and a bunch of separators. The names are just labels and the separators have their own type, which is separator. If you want to provide some sort of interleave, um, interleave range that takes a bunch of other ranges and allows you to iterate over the first, first, second, second, third, third, then the type of the element you get from this interleave iterator would have to be something like a variant, because you don't know which one it is until runtime. You don't know if it's going to be a text object or a separator object. 
And this variant obviously introduces some sort of overhead in your loop because you need to dispatch every, at every iteration. However, if you define this interleaving with a higher order function, as an example, for interleaved over here, and then you provide some overload, as we've seen before, that can either accept a text or a separator, and then you provide your ranges afterwards, then with this kind of design, you can actually generate code that will invoke the text and separator overload one after another without having to have a runtime check. So if you, if you imagine you have two ranges, you can simply use the template to generate code that will say, okay, invoke the first one, then the second one, first one, then the second one. So there's not gonna be any kind of if statement or dispatching as part of this iteration. Um, so yes, yeah, this is something you cannot really do with iterators as they need to have a concrete value type that's always the same when being returned, but with higher order function you can do better. So there's actually some alternatives to ranges I think is uh, Think Sales Implementation, which is a company do that does um, PowerPoint um, add-ons, and they use this kind of pool model for ranges, and they can compose them and get better performance because of these particular cases. Okay. So in general, higher order functions are very powerful. They have many different use cases. I feel they are way easier to write than existing alternatives. So when you need something quick, testable, reusable abstraction does not have to be that composable, they are great. However, if you need something a little bit more complicated and a little bit more flexible, then take the time to write some sort of iterator, range, or area guard. We might have language alternatives. We've seen coroutines, ranges, but also stuff like expansion statements. All of that stuff might be a good replacement for this in the future. They do not play nicely at all with control flow on the color side, because if you try to do return, break, continue in a lambda body, then it will be in the context of the lambda itself. So you can't really do an early return or anything like that. You can simulate this by basically returning some sort of enum that represents breaking or continue, but then it needs a lot more code and it defeats the purpose of the high order function in the first place. In 17, we got context per lambdas. In 20, we got uh, template lambdas, so they get even more powerful with time. And unfortunately, there is still a little bit of verbosity. Some proposals like this one from Barry Rasvin could have helped, which was the abbreviated lambda syntax abbreviated lambda syntax proposal, but it didn't go in. So we need, again, to write all the uh, preamble for the lambda, all the captures, and so on. Okay, any questions before I move to function ref? Okay. So we talked about higher order functions in general, but what options do we have to implement them in C++? So the first one that also applies to C is pointers to functions. So if you have some sort of operation and you want to take an action, what you can do is simply accept it as a pointer to a function. This is okay. It works with non-member functions and stateless, stateless closures, but as soon as you have any stateful callable, like a lambda with captures or a member function, then you cannot use this anymore. The good thing is that uh, it has very small runtime overhead, so if everything is the same in, this, in the same translation unit, it will be very likely inlined, and it's also constrained with an obvious signature. So you can already tell from the signature that f takes two integers and returns another one. So this is not good enough. We have template parameters. We've seen this in the beginning of the talk. You can take an action as some sort of forwarding reference f, and then uh, this will work with any function object or callable if you use a CD invoke, which implies you can use this with pointers to member functions, with stateful lambdas, and so on. This is what we consider a zero-cost abstraction because the compiler has all the information required to inline the function call to f, and you know it will usually do so if possible. However, before 20, this is hard to constrain in the sense you don't really see the signature of f as part of the signature of operation. You, it would have to either be documented or you would need some sort of enable it for something like that, which is not really easy to read. In 20, we get concepts, so I believe it would be quite easy to constrain this. You would say something like invocable of int, uh, int, int, and then it would just work. Uh, but even with that, there's a big drawback, which is degradation of compilation times and also lack of physical insulation, because you are forced to put these things in headers unless they are restricted to the scope of the CPP. But if you want to provide this abstraction to other people, they have to be defined in a header which can be a huge hit to compilation times. Then we have SCD function. Um, SCD function is nice in terms of flexibility. It works with any function object or callable. However, this has significant runtime overhead. I've tested it quite a lot. The problem is that 
given the fact that there is a small buffer optimization, given the fact that it can be um, an allocation, the compiler finds it really hard to inline and optimize. So this might change in the future, but right now every compiler is having trouble inlining this thing. Uh, another good thing is that it's constrained. It has a very obvious signature. I mean, you can see it here. It takes two integers and returns an int. You can also overload it, and it's going to do what you expect. However, another problem is that it's the type itself doesn't really specify the semantics. Like if you if you construct this with a cl closure, it's going to be owning the closure. If you construct it with a reference wrapper, it's going to be referencing another closure. So depending on how you invoke this, it might have reference or value semantics, which is not always a big deal, but it would be nice if we had a way to express that in the signature. And then we get to function ref. So function ref um, works like std function or templates with any function object or callable. It has super small runtime overhead. It is basically the same as a pointer to function. So if everything is in the same TU, every compiler I've tried is going to inline it really easily. Uh, it is constrained with an obvious signature, as you can see over here. And it has clear non owning semantics in the sense that the, the type itself, ref, tells you I'm never going to own, I'm just going to refer to something else. Um, it's also lightweight, and the way I like to think about it as a very rough approximation is that it's kind of like string view, but for callable objects instead of strings. So it's not going to own, it's just going to point to something else, and it's going to be quite cheap to copy and inline. So you can take it by value, as you can see here. So what is it? It's just a known only reference to a callable, so anything you can invoke, you can put it inside function ref. And the parallel that I mentioned is if a CD string has a non owning reference, which is string view, a CD function has a non owning reference, which is function ref. This means it doesn't own or extend the lifetime of the reference callable, so you need to be careful with it. And it's very lightweight, it's friendly to a no accept optimizations, and it's also trivially copyable, which means it can be passed in a register and doesn't have to go on the stack. I proposed this in P0792, which is currently in the library working group. This was supposed to be in 20. The only reason it didn't get in 20 was lack of time for the committee. And uh, many thanks to these people that helped a lot with the proposal itself and the design of the abstraction. So why would you ever use a function ref instead of a CD function? So there are two main reasons, performance and clear reference semantics. And why would you ever use function ref instead of template parameters? So this is where I think I found a sweet spot between function and template parameters, because function ref is easier to write, read, and teach. You don't have to teach people about concepts. You don't have to teach people about enable if, or reference wrapper, or uh, forwarding references. Uh, it's very trivial to understand what function ref is doing. Uh, also, you can use it in polymorphic hierarchies, and we did this in production a few times. So sometimes you, you, you want to take the hit of the virtual call, but not the hit of std function. So this is like a nice place in the middle. And compilation times get better because you don't have to define things in headers. So this gives you a little bit of physical insulation between your uh, declarations and definitions. This is how it looks like in terms of interface. As you can see, what we have in the paper is we, we recommend that this thing would be implemented as just a pointer to an object and a function pointer to a type erased way of accessing the, the, the thing we want to call. I'm going to show how it works later. Then this is a trivial copyable thing. It can be instantiated by any callable f. You can also assign it if you want, or reassign it. You can swap it, and then you can invoke it. So the, the interface here is quite lean. All you care about is mostly construction and invocation, and that's it. And as you can see, the invocation is always const qualified. So it has a shallow const kind of um, model where the function ref is always a const reference, and then you can invoke through it even mutable functions. So some use case examples from the real world. Again, this was when I was working on the trading system thing, a distributed system. Um, we require to basically store some commands given by the users and then replay them in order to test and verify their correctness. And these commands might have extra state associated with them, and so we didn't want them to be copied in multiple ways. And also, we didn't want to use share pointer because this was a single-threaded thing. So what we did was introduce two maps, a map from a command ID to a ref-counted command state. So you can imagine if we have the same command that happens multiple times in the same replay queue, instead of storing it multiple times, we simply refer to the same one with a command ID. And then we had a bunch of queues. These were like, imagine the users. Each user has its own queue. 
and it's on queue, and the queue has a set of command IDs. And by using this kind of design, we can uh, reduce memory consumption as we can reuse the same commands over and over. So when we wanted to replay all the actions of a user, we had this interface called iterate. It takes a queue ID, which is the queue of the user, and then a function ref that takes a command as a const reference and returns void. And then what we do as part of this iteration is that we find the queue, and if the queue exists, we go for the queue in reverse, and then we basically do the uh, indirection here where we get the item corresponding to the ID in the queue and invoke the function with it. So now if you think about it, implementing this with iterators would be a pain because what you need to do is some sort of iterator that under the hood, when dereferencing, goes to the other map and takes the item out of the other map and, and returns it, which would be quite annoying to write as the iterator itself needs to store state regarding the replay map. While if we invert the thing on its head and we simply provide an iterate function that takes an action, it's quite trivial to get that behavior over here. And this also gives us the freedom in the future to change the way this replay map work without uh, altering the interface that we provide to the users. Uh, function ref is a great candidate here because the function would have too much overhead for each single iteration and a template would require us to define this in the header and have longer compilation times. Function ref has a sweet spot in the middle where it's easy to inline line and doesn't require us to blow up our compilation times. Make sense? Another example, this one is with polymorphism. So we had this thing called a packet cache. It's similar to the one before. We just wanted to cache a bunch of stuff for testing purpose and performance. And we had a replay callback and a consume callback, and each cache could decide how to replay or consume. So you can imagine we had a mock packet cache, we had a linear packet cache, something with a map, and so on. So the interface was quite simple, and as you can see, we take uh, these callbacks here into virtual functions so that other people can override this. Replay is const, we don't want to mutate the packets, and consume is not const. As you can see here, we take a packet ref ref, so it means that we're gonna move it into the function ref. And we did use function ref for the virtual, as it's you know, fast enough, it's not as a heavyweight as a CD function, but you can still use it with runtime polymorphism. An example might be you have a contiguous packet cache, which is the simpler one, it just has a vector of packets, and then you replace simply just a loop over the vector and call the callback, and you consume is a loop over the vector and call the callback by moving the thing into the callback, and then you simply clear the vector. So again, this gives us a lot of freedom to play around with different implementations, uh, runtime without having to uh, implement complicated iterators or ranges, and the performance is quite good because we don't pay the price of a CD function on each call. Another one, this is quite similar to before. Uh, this was about sweeping over a bunch of machine nodes, find all the machines that have a particular, that are older than a particular timestamp, so maybe they timed out or they just come up, and then we execute some state change callback to either bring them down or bring them up depending on the timestamp. And this callback has a function ref, it takes a node ID with a state transition, and, and that's it. So what we basically did, I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but we find all the machines that are not down, and their last heartbeat was bigger than the threshold, and when we find them, we simply invoke the callback with a change state to down, so we uh, specify that these machines are not, uh, now not reachable, and then we remove them from the uh, another set. And if you think about it, it's exactly what we've seen at the beginning of the talk, is consume if, so we can rewrite it with consume if, and we get the benefit of not implementing the same abstraction twice, and also have this nice interface which can be changed in the future using uh, thanks to function ref. Okay, so let me see how I'm doing on time. Uh, the implementation of this thing, it's not really that complicated. Um, the first thing you have to do is basically provide a template which just takes a signature and then you specialize it by kind of unpacking or matching the signature. So you want to match the return statement, the return type of the signature, and the arguments as two different template parameters. So you can then access them in the body. Once you do that, then you can start having your state. As I mentioned before, all we're gonna have is some object pointer, a void star that points to the object when we, where we want to invoke the function on. And then we have some erase function, which is gonna uh, basically be our entry point our type arrays entry point to function ref. And as you can see, this arrays function takes a void star as the, fir as the first argument, 
And this voice star is going to be exactly the same as pointer. So we basically pass our own data member into the race function to make this work. And then it also takes the arguments we specified in, the, in our signature. So remember, this is our state over here. So what do we do on construction? On construction, we take some callable object f, which can be any lambda, closure, pointer member function, whatever. And then inside uh, the pointer, we store the address of this thing. So no matter what it is, we simply take its address and store it there. It can be a lambda or a function pointer, whatever. And then we set the erase function to this closure over here that takes the pointer itself as the first argument, the arguments that we specified in the signature, and returns what also we specified in the signature. And then the body of this thing will simply invoke the, point, the pointer we passed after casting it to f. And we can do it here because we have f as part of this scope. So we get from the pointer, which is void star, we get back the original type, which is f. So we do the type erasure here. And then once we actually have the type of the object f, we can invoke it with all, all our arguments. So this is the way we, it works. Basically, we provide a stateless closure, which can be stored as part of a function pointer that accepts our own object pointer. So this pointer over here will be the same as the one over here. And then since in this context we, that we have the type information, we can retrieve it again inside the body of the race function. And then we can finally invoke it uh, targeting the right uh, type. Any questions on this? Mm -hmm. for, for the arguments. So the question is really good is why don't you use R value references for the arguments rather I would say um, forwarding references. Uh, the reason is that that would be a pessimization if you use uh, types like ints and floats because then they would have to be taken by reference and then that would not be the same as taking them by value, which could be slower in some cases. So we discussed this quite a lot in, in library evolution and we decided to do, this, to do this this way because there is proof that taking small types of a value is faster and also for consistency with std function, which does the same thing. So std function takes things exactly as specified in the signature. So invocation is also simple. What we do is simply we invoke the erase function with the pointer data member, which was the thing we had before. So as you remember, this pointer over here is the one accepted in this lambda. And then we pass all the arguments here. Again, the same principle applies. We, takes, we take args dot dot, not args ref dot dot, to maintain the value semantics of small types like int and float. That's pretty much it. That's um, bare bones implementation of function ref. It fits on one slide, so it's not a particularly complicated type, but it is a good thing to standardize it as it's present in multiple code bases. You can find it in Foldy, you can find it in the GDB code base, LLVM code base, and a bunch of other places. So it's good to have this as a standard library vocabulary type. Another interesting thing is the no accept support. Um, basically, if a signature that you provide has a no access specifier, then the wording here requires the function itself to be no throw invocable when you construct a function ref. What that basically means in layman's terms is that if you specify no accept here after your signature, then the function ref will only work with no accept functions. So if you have a function f that takes this function ref thing in avoid no accept, it will not compile if you attempt to invoke it with a my throw function over here but it will compile if you attempt to call it with a well-behaved function over here, which is smart not accept. So this is the same behavior described um, in this paper here by David Krauss, which was proposed to fix a CD function. Um, however, a CD function cannot be fixed for backwards compatibility reasons. But it's good to have this because now you can also overload depending on whether your callable is not accept or not. So that can lead you to better performance or exception guarantees in your program. And obviously, you can also force the const if you want uh, as part of the arguments, if it's a member function, and so on. So let's talk about the bad things about function ref. Uh, I have some more slides afterwards, but this is like the introduction to the problem. Function ref is just a reference, like string view. So it does not extend the lifetime of the thing you hold. So this example here, which might look innocent, is actually undefined behavior. If you create a closure through a lambda expression and then assign it to a construct a function ref with it called get number, and then you invoke it, this will likely work, but it's completely undefined behavior because the lifetime of this temporary ends in this line over here. 
when we get to this line over here, the temporary lambda is not alive anymore. So the function ref is actually a dangling reference. So in general, this has the same lifetime concerns as string view, maybe a little bit worse because string view works with string literals, but this one doesn't work with lambdas. So whenever you use it as a function parameter, everything is usually fine because you create a temporary, the temporary is gonna live long enough for the invocation of the function. But whenever you're using function ref either on the stack or on a container, you need to be very careful to guarantee that whatever function ref is referring to will outlive the function ref itself. So this is the drawback. We don't have any particular way of detecting this at the moment, but there's, been, there's work being done, I think, by Herb and other people into introducing lifetime annotations into C++, which might allow the compiler to detect these use cases and prevent undefined behavior. Another sad thing is constexpr. I had to remove it from the last revision, which is R4. It is not implementable. It, any, in any way, it would require some sort of reinterpret cast or cast from void star to do the type erasure but these are not allowed in constexpr, even in C++20. Uh, so this unfortunately causes people to either use templates or write the code both with a template uh, method and with a function ref, so some sort of duplication. Um, I'm not sure what we can do about this. Maybe someday we'll have those two things I mentioned allowed in constexpr context, but it's hard for compile implementers, so that's unlikely to happen anytime soon. Or maybe we could just say, you know, make function ref some magic type like a CD allocator for 20, and then it could work on Sexpert, but uh, the committee wasn't happy about that suggestion. Okay, now benchmarks, the things I hope you've been waiting for. What I've done is use Simon Brand is implementation of FunctionRef, which is compliant to the paper, and I think he's here at the conference, so you can talk to him about it if you want. And I use squidbench.com, which internally uses Google Benchmark. This is a nice website that basically allows you to benchmark stuff and prints out a nice graph. Scenario is really simple. I have a loop, and inside this loop, I invoke higher the function over and over again. And I tested this with template parameters, function ref, and a CD function with and without inlining. So there's like six different dimensions here. Uh, this is what it looks like. I have this uh, template parameter, higher order function. It just calls f. A CD function, function ref, they simply just call the function without doing anything. And I use this benchmark do not optimize, which prevents Google test from uh, eliding a call that doesn't have any side effect. So it will still, it's still forced to generate assembly for the function call. Uh, I do the same without inlining, and then my tests are basically iterate over the state, and state is provided by Google test, and it just, sorry, by Google benchmark, and it just provides um, a number of iterations which is good enough to get statistical information about this thing. And I have a benchmark for every single one. Okay, so first one, I'm using GCC 8, uh, 03, and lib standard C++. And you can see that with inlining, template parameters and function ref are exactly the same. So if you have inlining enabled, if it happens, there is no cost to using function ref over a template parameter, which is quite nice. Uh, if you don't have inlining, the template parameter gets 3.5x compared to the other ones. Then we have function, so std function with inlining, that's at least seven times slower than function ref with inlining. So if you have everything the same to you, just changing std function to function ref might give you a seven times speed up. Uh, without inlining, function ref has eight time, time loss compared to a template parameter, so it's significant. But still, compared to a non inline std function, is way faster. So even without inlining, it is beneficial to use function ref compared to a CD function. But the thing I like about the, the most about function ref is this case over here where it's basically the same as a template. I tried this with Clang and it's pretty much the same. You can see function and function ref have at least eight times uh, difference in time with inlining and even without inlining, function ref is way faster. I tried this with libc++, libc++ std function was a little bit faster, but not that much. You still get seven times slowdown if you use it compared to function ref. It's a little bit better in, without inlining, but still um, the, the hierarchy is always the same. So in general, the conclusions are that when inlining happens, which is quite likely if everything is in the same TU, then function ref is as fast as a template parameter, but doesn't have to destroy your compilation time, so it doesn't have to make your interface a little bit harder to read. And a CD function is at least seven times lower than function ref with inlining enabled. So this is what I've seen in the latest compilers. You've seen the versions there. It may change in the future. There's nothing preventing this compiler from being more aggressive. 
but the way the function is defined, which has a small buffer optimization, possible allocation, and you know all that polymorphism stuff, it just doesn't lend itself very well to the optimizer. Again, this may change, but it's unlikely. Uh, when inlining doesn't happen, uh, function ref is around two times lower than a template parameter. However, uh, even though the, the gap between function ref and function is smaller, a CD function is always 1.5 time uh, times slower than function ref. So again, you might still have benefit in using it. So I would say function ref is optimizer friendly and thrives with inlining, and it's always faster than CD function depend independently of whether you have inlining or not. So I have some more, I have four minutes, give you some ideas of the design decision and controversies about this thing. Uh, so people really wanted this thing to be maximum size of two pointers, and I wanted to be this, this way as well, because it makes it more lightweight to copy and likely to be passed in registers. And there was a very vocal opposition to bigger sizes. As a consequence, if you have something like a pointer to member function, which is like this one over here, since pointer to member functions can be bigger than a void star, then uh, they always need to outlive the function ref itself. Like the function ref cannot store it internally and prevent undefined behavior. So in this case, if you uh, have the service connect inside a function ref and then you call it, it will be undefined behavior because this temporary function pointer has gone out of scope after this line over here. So this is undefined behavior. Uh, we cannot fix this without inc increasing the size of function ref, so we're not gonna fix it. However, there is something interesting which is Technically, we can make this work for pointer to functions as they are small enough. So theoretically, we could say, okay, if you have a connect function that takes a service and we create a function ref that stores the address of connect, then theoretically we could say, okay, instead of storing the address of the temporary instance of this thing, we simply move the pointer inside function ref and that should work. However, this is still undefined behavior because we still take the address of the temporary and the reason is that we don't want to have inconsistencies between pointer to functions, pointer to member function, and lambdas. Because now people are going to rely on this use case and it's going to be harder to teach. While if we always say, you know, it's always undefined behavior to take something that's a temporary and you have to take it as a function argument or be careful with it, then it's going to be easier and more consistent. So this is a source of controversy, but uh, EDWG approved this design. And even though there's some opposition, in the end, having the inconsistency between PMFs and pointers, and pointers to functions is not great either. And this is not a common use case, so it's not a big deal. Uh, last thing that maybe we could change is the main use case for function ref is to be as a function parameter. So that's the way it avoids any lifetime problem. However, it still has an assignment operator, which is kind of weird, uh, as it's difficult to make the assignment operator work without um, undefined behavior. So if you just, it could be misleading because people might think, okay, it has an assignment, so it stores something. So they might write something like this menu over here where you store the choice inside a function ref uh, after here, and then you invoke it. But this would be undefined behavior as well because you're storing, you're assigning um, a temporary which would be going out of scope afterwards. So again, this doesn't work. Um, one thing we could do is remove the assignment operator. We'll make it more explicit that this thing is not supposed to be used as a storage, but more like a function parameter. However, there still are some use cases where the assignment operator can be used, which are valid. They are simply more rare and harder to get right, but they still exist. And finally, the other thing is that if you in initialize a function with a reference wrapper, it does not actually have any special case to unwrap it. So the function ref will point to the reference wrapper, which will point to something else. This has double indirection and affects the semantics. Theoretically, since they both live in STD, then it could do something special and unwrap it. But um, there was an anonymous dissent to this, uh, to have this unwrapping, as they don't want a special case reference wrapper in this case. And um, you know, this kind of use case is again quite rare. It's weird that you would instantiate a function ref with a reference wrapper because function ref is a reference, you don't need a reference wrapper. Um, and changing it might change the semantics of how this works. So this is another point of controversy, but again, I don't think it's a big deal. However, some people really want this to work this way and they have good reasons, so it's something to consider. Another last thing was a suggestion I got from Adam called Yak Online, which is this could be more efficient if we allow people to store multiple signals at the same time. So instead of saying function ref of something, I can have a function ref of either void of int or double or whatever. And then I can invoke it with some overloads. 
This could be implemented more efficiently compared to having multiple function refs. You can store everything in the same pointers. And you don't need an extra overhead of an object for each signature. Um, this is a nice idea. I think it will make the function ref specification more complicated. It will delay it to maybe 26. So maybe we could have a multi-function ref or a backwards compatible feature addition in the future, or maybe you know it's not just not justifiable, and you should write your own. So that's it. Uh, basically, what I wanted to express with this talk is that higher order functions are quite useful for very use cases, and you don't need to go fully functional to benefit from them. You can introduce them slowly in your code base, gradually, and they still will help you. And that now we have function ref. You can use it today if you use the implementation from Simon, which is uh, called Tartan Lama on GitHub. And it has clear semantics and high performance compared to a CD function, and it's probably going to be in 20, in 23, 20, the ship has sailed. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we are out of time for questions, but I'll be around, so feel free to find me.